Amen. He is risen. risen Amen. We had an awesome first two services this morning. The first one was the sunrise service, so we were outside under that big tree right out front. And uh, it reminded me of, of nine years ago when my wife Jennifer and I went to Uganda and we adopted two boys, Nathaniel and Elijah, and, and I had a chance while we were there to preach at several different villages in the countryside. And one of the villages, the church, met under a tree. That was it. They, they didn't have a building. That was, that was where they did worship services. And uh, it just reminded me a little bit of that. It reminds me that today, all across our globe, there are people from every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping our risen Savior. And that is our hope. That's not, not just our hope. It's the hope of the entire world. Today is a day of hope. And that's what I hope to talk about to you today is that you know, maybe, maybe your hope is in Jesus. Maybe you've come in here and he is your hope. I hope that today you leave here feeling reaffirmed in that, that no matter how hard things might be for you right now, that's the right person to have your hope in. Or maybe you've come in here and your hope is not in Jesus Christ. Maybe you have hope in, in other things, maybe things that are probably good things, things like um, you know, just your family's well-being or, or success or you know, maybe the hope of just a better life. And I want you to see that while those are good things, they are temporary things. And if you place, place all your hope in those things, you have to understand that your hope now has an expiration date. I want you to find that there is a person, Jesus Christ, who is eternal, who is living. And that's where we will point to today, to a lasting hope in him. And I think there are good reasons. In fact, I know there are good reasons. Now, I want to look at three pieces of evidence today as to why it is worth it for us to base all of our hopes on Jesus Christ. And we're going to jump right in to our passage uh, we're going to read Luke 24, verses 13. We'll just start by reading all the way to verse 21. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he, Jesus, said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. So this, this guy, Cleopas, and his friend were two of Jesus' disciples. They were not part of that group of 12. Uh, but Jesus had other disciples besides the 12. Uh, in fact, he probably had about 120 disciples, though the 12 were his closest. And so these two were of that that other sort of not as close group. And, uh, and of course, they're sad about what's happened as they walk on this journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Again, it's a seven-mile journey, as the text says. And we have to think, you know, a seven-mile journey in that day and age was, a, was an arduous journey. That's a long journey. It's at least a two-hour, maybe more, um, depending on the terrain. It was probably mountainous terrain. They might have been going down the mountains. And so it was a, a dangerous, treacherous, long journey journey, and somewhere along the way, a guy comes up that they think is just a random traveler, but it's Jesus, and, and they don't recognize him, even though they would have spent many, many different um, dinners or times together with him. They know Jesus, yet they don't recognize that this guy is Jesus, and so apparently they think he's just some random traveler who hasn't heard what's been going on. They're like, how, how can you not have heard the news? It's almost like if you met somebody today in 2022 who had never heard that there was a thing called COVID, had never heard there was a pandemic. Like, is there anyone left in the world that doesn't know about COVID? I don't think so. I, maybe there is, but if, if so, I, I have not met that person. And so it'd be like that. And so they just stop dead in their tracks, like mouths gaping open at this guy. Like, you, you, you haven't heard what happened, you know? And so... Their, their hope had been that this, this Messiah, this Jesus, was going to come and free them from oppression, 
to the Romans. Dr. Clark, who preached last week, talked about how the, the Jews had been oppressed for hundreds of years. It was the Romans, and before the Romans, it was the Greeks, and before the Greeks, it was the Persians, before the Persians, it was the Babylonians. For over 500 years, they had been ruled by other people, and they were longing to be free. They were longing for Israel to return to glory, to return to the day when they were their own master, and they thought Jesus was going to be the guy to lead a mighty army and crush the Romans and restore Israel to earthly glory. So their hope depended on Jesus being alive. But they, they never imagined that Jesus was going to die. They, even though Jesus himself said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and be delivered up and killed, they just still didn't get it. They, they thought our hope is, on, is in something that's it's going to make our life better now. It's going to give us health or success now. And now that hope is crushed because Jesus has been killed. So their, in their eyes, Jesus' death was an utter failure. But let's see what happens next. Verses 21 through 24. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back, saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So they hear the strange reports from, you know, if you remember the, the story right after uh, on, on that third day, the women are so, of, of Jesus' disciples are some of the first people to see that the tomb is empty and even to meet Jesus. And so they run back and they report it. But yet these people still haven't heard that someone actually met Jesus, the living Jesus. And so they're still not sure. I mean, is it true that Jesus could have risen from the dead? Or are these women just, were they making this up? Is this like some kind of a myth? Are they hallucinating? Maybe they're so tired and, and stricken with grief that they're just, just seeing things. Well, look, it's neither one of those. This is, this is a real historical fact. The resurrect resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact and the only logical conclusion based on the events that took place. The first, time, the first way we see that is through the fact that our gospel writers are, are eyewitnesses. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew and John were two of Jesus' 12 disciples. Mark might have been Peter's son. It, it at least was a friend of Peter and someone who was close to Peter. So the, Mark, the gospel of Mark is probably Peter's account of life with Jesus. Uh, and then Luke was a physician who traveled around what, like a documentary reporter, and he interviewed people who had been with Jesus. And so all of these events that we read in the Gospels are based on eyewitness accounts. They're not hearsay, they're not rumor, they're eyewitness accounts. And then we have the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a murderer. He was a, he was a Pharisee who, who delighted in putting Christians to death. And then all of a sudden, he's on his way to Damascus, and Jesus strikes him blind and, and just completely opens his eyes to see the truth of the gospel. And now Paul goes from a murderer to the greatest missionary and church planner we've ever seen. He is an eyewitness of the power of Jesus, of the resurrected Jesus. And then Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 how when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to more than 500 people at one time. So this is not like, you know, one guy saw some vision and wrote it down and just we're supposed to just believe what he said. This is based on eyewitness accounts. It's based on historical fact. And these are very difficult claims to dispute when there's so many accounts that line up. This is not a myth. It's not a hallucination. Now, another claim that people have, have suggested is that maybe Jesus didn't actually die. Maybe he was just like in a coma for three days and then he woke up. Happens, I mean, medically speaking, people wake up from comas, but I think there's plenty of evidence to dispute that as well. You see, when Jesus was arrested, they delivered him over to be beaten first. He was scourged. And, and, and what that means is actually that he was beaten with something called a cat of nine tails, which is a whip that was designed not just to whip you, but then to also uh, tear flesh from your body as it was released from whipping you. And he was whipped probably 39 times 
with that whip so that his flesh would have been completely shredded before he went to the cross. So, and, and we probably, <laughs> that's, that gives you some context as to why he could not carry his cross. And he had to have Simon of Cyrene carry it for him. And then, of course, we know he was nailed to the cross. But I don't know if you know this, but when, when they crucified people, usually people died from ex- asphyxiation. Because you would have to, as you're, as you're hanging there by those three nails, you would have to pull your body up like this every time you breathed. And, and people were in such pain and just so weak that usually they just died because they stopped being able to breathe. Now Jesus, it says in Luke 23, 46, that he didn't die because of that. It says that he gave up his spirit and breathed his last. But then we also know that the Romans speared him in the side just to make sure he was dead. And so I would say that one, the Bible says he was dead. Two, common sense tells us that it's very unlikely anyone could survive all of that. But then there's one more detail that's important. Matt Chandler, a uh, pastor over in Dallas, preached a sermon on, on this passage a number of years ago, and he makes the point that if Jesus had suffered through all of those events, and we're saying that he didn't die, and that he was just in a coma, And three days later, he's now walking seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus? How is that possible? If that had happened to me, I wouldn't be able to walk seven centimeters, let alone seven miles. I I mean, I would think it would take you three years to maybe recover from all of that, let alone three days. So the only logical explanation here is that actually he was dead, and he did rise, and he had a new body. Not a body that had awoken from a coma, a body that was a new creation after a death and a resurrection. And now he's capable not just of walking seven miles, but seven trillion miles if he wanted to. It doesn't even matter because he's a perfect new creation. There is clear evidence that this is a historical reality, that the Son of God died on the cross, rose from the grave, and defeated death. And this changes all of our hopes. It changes all of our hopes. Maybe you, like, like I do so often, have your hopes set on things that are temporary, whether it's just your own personal comfort or happiness or, or your family's well-being or your success, or, or maybe it's even on a bigger scale, we have our hope in human progress or, or you know, politics or, or even like the environment, saving the planet. All those things are fine things, but they only go so far, right? They, they only, they, they have an expiration date. At some point, they'll run out. But the risen Jesus gives us a person in whom we can hope, a person who is eternal, a person who promises not just to give us a better life now. That's actually not even a promise that he gives us. He actually promises to give us new things, to make all things new, to make us new creations and to recreate the entire world. That's the hope that we have, and that's what the Bible promises. So let's go back to the story And look at this next set of verses. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning Himself. So the next piece of evidence that I want you to see here is that the resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises in the Old Testament. Jesus is not playing dumb anymore here on this, on this walk. He, he's not asking silly questions. He is turning up the intensity. He's teaching them the greatest Sunday school lesson that anybody's ever taught. Basically give, gives them a reason to believe that their hopes for a restored Israel right now Those were not enough. Their hopes were not strong enough. He's saying, if you look at the scriptures, you'll see a better hope. You'll see something that way better than a than a restored nation of Israel. So he says, it says that he teaches them everything in Moses and the prophets that were concerning him. What does that mean? Well, Moses and the prophets, or or sometimes it's referred to as the law and the prophets, is another way of describing the Old Testament as a whole. And so it's saying that 
Jesus showed them on this seven-mile journey all the things in the Old Testament concerning him. But you're like, wait a minute, there's, there's no mention of Jesus in the Old Testament. It never, never talks about him. Well, think about, think about it this way. When, when all the Avengers movies were coming out, and I, and I get it, they're, they're on like the fourth generation now, or so, I don't know what they're on, but, but when the first, you know, the cool original Avenger movies were coming out, you always want to wait and, and watch all the way through the credits, because you knew at the end of the credits there was going to be a, some sort of a little teaser, right? Like at the end of the, I think it's the first Iron Man, where after the credits they show you like Thor's hammer or something like that. I, it's been a while since I've seen it, but... Um, but that's the idea is that you would get this teaser of what's, what's to come next, okay? And in a, in a bigger and better way, the Old Testament is a teaser for the coming of the Messiah. And you're like, now wait a minute, I, I thought it was just all these rules and genealogies and stories about people living to be 900 and all these wars and weird things like that and donkeys talking to people and it is that. But all of it serves as a as a giant sign pointing ahead to, this is not the point. The point is the Messiah, and he's coming. That's what the Old Testament is about, that the Messiah is coming, and he's going to usher in the good life. Not not a good life in this life, not a temporary life like these guys hope for, but the good life where God recreates the heavens and the earth so that mankind can dwell with God face to face. This is what the Old Testament promises in the prophets. Isaiah 65, 17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Can you imagine an earth, a world where it is so perfect, it is so new, that you cannot even remember the bad things that happened to you in your life. The pain, the suffering, the sorrow, the grief. It's just, it's so good here now that those things are not in your mind anymore. Can you, can you imagine that? That's what Jesus promises to us. That's what the Old Testament promises to us. And that promise is fulfilled in the Messiah, in Jesus Christ. But look at what he says in verse 26. This kind of starts to really flip things for, for these, these two disciples. He says, Jesus says, was it not necessary that the Christ had to suffer these things and enter his glory? So again, the, the coming of the new heavens and new earth, the coming of, you know, if you want to call it the, the utopia or whatever, the new creation, it's not going to come about by any conventional means. It's not going to come about by some powerful leader, you know, gathering followers and building an army and, and, and just taking over. That's not the way it's going to work. He says, the new heavens and new earth are going to come about because the Christ suffers and dies. And that makes no sense unless you know what it says in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 is just one example. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why did Jesus have to suffer and die? Why not just come, build an army, and, and, and crush the Romans, and restore Israel to its glory? Well, because crushing the Romans wouldn't solve the problem. Crushing the Romans would just mean that someone else would come and take over, or it might mean that Israel themselves would become the oppressors and they would go take somebody else over and just perpetuate the problem. No, the problem is not the Romans. The problem is not whatever problem we have right now that is troublesome to us, whether it's a pandemic or a war or inflation. No, the problem is our sin. The problem is our sin because it separates us from God. We were meant to be with God, and we're not with God and unless our sin is overcome. The good life that we all long for is a life with God. And the only way we get that is if Jesus, the Messiah, is pierced for our transgressions, is crushed for our iniquities, if by his wounds we are healed. 
And he's done it. This is, this is the day when we remember that he's done it. And his resurrection is the proof. So his death was not an utter failure. His death was a success. His death was exactly what needed to happen. He told us it was going to happen. And so because of this, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is what the Old Testament, again, points to. If you think about the Exodus, when the Israelites are in Egypt and God is sending the plagues and he says the tenth plague is going to be the worst because it's going to be the death of the firstborn. But Israel, here's what you need to do to avoid this plague. Slaughter an unblemished lamb, take its blood and cover the doorpost of your household with it. And if you do that, the angel of death will pass over your home and everybody inside that home will be saved. And that's exactly what happened. And that's why the Jews celebrated the Passover, but every time they celebrated the Passover, they ate lamb because the lamb had to be perpetually sacrificed. Fast forward to the New Testament. John the Baptist, who's sort of the forerunner of Jesus, he prepared the way for Jesus. He sees Jesus in John 1, 29, and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. He is, he is the better Passover lamb. He's the Passover lamb that once he is sacrificed, there need be no more sacrifices because his blood covers our sin perpetually forever for eternity. He is the Lamb of God. And in Revelation, which we read Revelation 5 earlier, he is seen as the Lamb who was slain, and yet the Lamb who has triumphed because he was slain. And he's mentioned in Revelation as the Lamb of God throughout numerous times. His death, being slain on the cross, and his resurrection from the grave has meant death for our sin. And let me explain how that works by way of Harry Potter. So, and I I ruined Harry Potter for a young lad in in our sunrise service. And so if you do not know how Harry Potter ends and you want to actually read it or watch it, cover your ears because I'm I'm fitting to spoil this for you. If you don't care, then it's whatever. If you don't know anything about Harry Potter, I'm going to give you some some vocab real quick. Uh, There's a guy, Voldemort, he's bad. We don't like him, okay? We want him to die. Um, Voldemort is so weird and twisted that he's like split his soul seven ways and put him in these things called horcruxes. And so along the way, our characters figure out if we're going to kill Voldemort, we got to kill the horcruxes. So they start knocking off these horcruxes, right? Well, then somewhere along the way, Harry realizes he himself is a horcrux, that he has a part of Voldemort's soul on him or in him or something. And the only way that they're going to kill Voldemort is if Harry lets Voldemort kill him. That's exactly what happens. Harry lets Voldemort hit him with a killing curse. But what Voldemort doesn't realize is because he kills Harry, he essentially kills himself. Because Harry dies, that part of Voldemort died with him. And in a much greater and and way more important and impactful way, when Jesus was on the cross suffering everything that he suffered, the iniquity of us all was laid on him. And then he died, which means death to our sin. Our sin is still a problem. Yes, every single day we sin. But you know what? It has a clear and final end. You can, you can actually read about it in the book of Revelation. There is a day coming when our sin will be no more, and that's because Jesus dealt it a mortal death blow on the cross. And so these are just a few different examples of how Jesus came and was the fulfillment of well over 300 different Old Testament prophecies. If you read the, the, the Gospels, you'll probably see, especially in the book of Matthew, there are instances where he says, Jesus did this so as to fulfill the prophecy from the prophet Isaiah, yada, yada, yada. He fulfilled tons of these prophecies all throughout his life in his death and in his resurrection. And in so doing, we have every reason to believe that we can put our hope and trust in him. And as a side note, this also means that we have the interpretive key to understand the entire Bible. Maybe you have read the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, and you thought, this is confusing, this is boring, I don't understand why we have to read about skin diseases and whether or not it's this skin disease or that skin disease. I don't get all these laws. 
I'm telling you, though, if you understand that this, this Old Testament, this old book of, of what seems like rules and laws, if you understand that it is designed to point us ahead to our need for Jesus Christ, it changes how you read it. It changes its meaning. Because now, like the Ten Commandments, for instance, a lot of people think of the Ten Commandments as, like, we have to do these things in order to get in good with God. Like, we've got to, throughout our whole life, we've got to do the commandments, keep the laws, and hopefully at the end, we've got a pretty good resume. Like, I hand that, when I die, I hand that resume to God, and I'm like, all right, here it is. Hope, hope it's enough. But that's, that's actually not the way the commandments work. And praise God, because our resume is never going to be enough. We, we do not have a good enough resume to hand to God and say, it's enough. No, it's not. It has to be perfect. Jesus himself said, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the good news is, is that Jesus has the perfect resume. Jesus came and kept the commandments for us. And Jesus, at the, at the end of time, on the day of judgment, will present his resume to the Father on our behalf. So that my hope is not in my resume or my behavior, it's in his. And if he is perfect, then I have every reason to hope that I will be safe, that I will be in the kingdom of God. Not because of me, but because of him. It is an act of grace. It is a gift of grace that any of us enters the kingdom of heaven. And so the Ten Commandments are not about, the, they're not the gate to get in. They're not the way that we get in. They are, they are the, the, the boundaries. They show us here, if, if you are in obedience to these Ten Commandments, that means that you are enjoying life with God. That's the difference. We only see it that way, though, if we understand that these things are meant to point us to Jesus, if, if we see these things through the lens of Jesus Christ. And then the last thing that we see, the last bit of evidence, is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ transforms not just our Bible reading, but our, but our entire lives. Let's look at verses 28 through 35. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while, we, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered, saying, The Lord has indeed risen, and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So this last piece of evidence that we point to is that the resurrection of Jesus produces real life change in us. We can be the evidence ourselves. So this, this historical event that God promised in the Old Testament, it actually does have the power to change our lives. The good news of the gospel is the power of God for those who believe. We see this on, on, uh, in the story. After this seven-mile walk, Cleopas and his friend, they're tired, they're eating dinner, they're at the table with Jesus, and then Jesus breaks the bread, and suddenly they see that it's him, and he just vanishes. He's gone. And we don't, under, we don't really know exactly why uh, the breaking of the bread is what opened their eyes to see that it was Jesus. Um, a commentator named William Hendrickson has some speculation. He says, did they see the marks of the nails in his hands? Was it the manner in which he broke bread? And gave it to them that opened their eyes, or was it the way he spoke to the Father that refreshed their memories? Whatever the reason, there's something about breaking the bread, like he does at the Lord's Supper, that opens their eyes to the fact that this is Jesus. And then they, re they reflect on the incredible impact that, that he had on them as they walked together. They say, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? I love this verse. Partly because that, that Greek word for burn, it's used as a verb here, but in the noun form, it means an, an arsonist. It's, it's someone who sets things on fire. And, and this is showing us that Jesus sets our hearts on fire as he relates to us his word. 
And I don't mean, I don't think this means that he fills us with intense feelings all the time. I, I think sometimes we, we have this idea that Christianity is about like feeling it, catching the feeling and, and, and feeling like these emotional highs, these, these warm fuzzies all the time. And I, I just, I want you to know if you believe that, I, I need you to know that that's not always the case. There are times when we go through life as a, as a follower of Christ where we do not feel like doing this. Where the only thing we have is the faith that Jesus Christ gets us through. Because so, there's times when it's just hard. It's just, it is just overwhelming to be a Christian. Because the world is, a, is, in, a, is in opposition to us. Jesus himself said that if the world hates me, it's going to hate you. And so being a Christian is not about warm, fuzzy feelings all the time. There are certainly things that that Jesus does in our lives that fill us with joy. But it's not about feeling good all the time. I just wanted to make sure that's, that's clear because I think what this is really talking about is not just feeling good, but giving us new hearts that are capable of understanding the gospel, that are capable of faith. And, and this is promised in the Old Testament, by the way. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27 says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put Within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And I hope you see the passivity for human beings there. In other words, this does not say that you will give yourself a new heart or that or that you will make a decision to have a new heart. No, this says I will give you a new heart. A new heart, being a new creation, faith in Jesus Christ, is a gift from God. It's grace. It's not something we earn. It's not something that we can decide to go get. It is something that is given to us through the Holy Spirit. And this, this prophecy of Ezekiel 36, the new heart, the new spirit, we see the fulfillment of, the, of it in the New Testament. Romans 8, 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we see how God specifically is going to give us a new heart through Jesus, through his spirit. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, here's what's going to happen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So we become new creations in Christ even now, even now before we inhabit the perfect creation, which, which will, ha- will come about when Jesus returns. But we begin becoming new creations now. We have a life change now. So this is not about, as many of us might think, this is not about us becoming better versions of ourselves now. It's not even about having a better life now. This is about becoming new versions of ourselves now. But not, again, not a better life now, not a better version of ourselves now, not feeling better about ourselves. This is not therapy. This is not self-help. This is not a way to be more successful in life. If that's all we think this is, then we have a very wrong understanding of what our need is. Because our need is not to be better versions of ourselves. Our need is to be new selves because of our sin. Because our sin is leading us to eternal death. It is leading us to separation from God forever, and that is not a problem we can overcome by being better versions of ourselves. That is only a problem that is overcome by Jesus Christ and his life, death, and resurrection. If we know him, we know that our sin was put on him on the cross, and we believe that that's true, that he paid it all for us, and then we forsake our sins and submit our lives to him as Lord, then he will save us and make us new creations. That is a promise. And that's the only thing that explains what these two guys in our story do next. Because you see, they immediately ran back to Jerusalem. The seven-mile journey that we talked about as being long and arduous, they just turned around and went back at night when you, when you never traveled back then. You didn't travel at night because it was dangerous. You couldn't see, and they didn't care. They just ran back to Jerusalem because they were like, we've got to tell somebody. We've got to tell the guys. We've got to tell the women that what they said, yeah, we, we saw him too. We know it's true. He is risen. They had to go tell people. Do you see that kind 
of resurrection, new creation evidence in your own life? Do you see that you are more and more hungering for God, for, for his presence, hungering for his word, to see the truth of his word? Do you desire obedience? And, and again, some people will think, oh, if you, you become a Christian, that means you're perfect now. No, 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 no. <laughs> we know that's not true. We know that's not possible in this life. We're not perfect. What we are is wanting more and more to forsake our sin, more and more hating our sin because it leads us away from Christ. If that is true of you, then I think you are a new creation in Christ. I think the Bible says you are a new creation in Christ and you have every reason to hope in him. And if that's not true of you yet, if that doesn't sound familiar, then what is stopping you? What is stopping you from putting your hope, your faith in Jesus and becoming a new creation? The evidence is clear. The evidence of the resurrection is clear. And so it is worth basing all of your hope on Jesus Christ. Let's pray.